welcome to Bread and Thread, a podcast about food and domestic history. I'm Liz. I'm Hazel. We're two friends who studied archaeology together and love history. So I'm quite excited about what I've been making this week because my my pattern arrived for the reversible chameleon. Oh, so I've been is... working very hard on this. That is definitely a great thing to spend a lot of effort on. How how's it coming? Um, I'm past the halfway point. I have <laughs> everything but the limbs and the eyes done for one side, and I'm currently working on the. I think I'm just at the bum of the other side. Okay. So it's it's getting there. It's starting to look like a lizard. That's really exciting. Is it um uh, is it different colours on different sides? It's grey on one side and multicoloured on the other side, just all random stripes. Oh, business on the inside, party on the outside? Exactly like when I wear my iridescent blue Doc Martens to work. <laughs> awesome. You should take the chameleon to work. I'm not entirely sure where it would go in the People's History Museum, but I Just at least feel like my supervisor would enjoy it. Place it strategically around the displays and see if anyone notices. See, now I'm slightly tempted to make one for my supervisor for when my placement ends as a thank you. You should. A chameleon is the perfect gift. I feel like she'd be into it. Yeah. I have also been baking this week. Have you been baking? Well, I was really craving chocolate cake. The only chocolate that we had in was Options Hot Chocolate Powder. But it turns out if you make, like, a whole cup's worth of powder with just like 50 millilitres of water and mix that into a cake. You can get a flavoured chocolate cake, so we ended up with chocolate orange cake. Oh, wow. That's such a coincidence. I made chocolate orange cupcakes the other day. Oh. They were great. They had mini eggs on top and orange buttercream. You either sent me a picture or put it in the Bread and Thread Discord server. I, I will do that because... They were great. I'm also, um, I'm kind of a quarantine cliche at this point because I started a sourdough starter. Does it have a pun name like ours does? It's the important question. Yes, it's called Sour Joe. Is that after your boyfriend? (laughs) It is named after my boyfriend. (laughs) But also, it, it works as a pun. So, yes. How how does Joe feel about this? I think he's equal parts like weirded out and kind of proud. <laughs> but you know, I you know I can't see him for the foreseeable future. So the sour st- sourdough starter is a fairly good replacement, I think. I've been toying with the idea of printing out a picture of his face and sticking it on <laughs> to the lid of the you stuff. Make a little bread. You should make a little bread boy. (laughs) It's like a gingerbread man made of regular bread. I think now we're getting into slight wicker man territory. (laughs) Hey Joe, I I made you a voodoo doll out of bread to show my love. I mean, I I was thinking of the film Little Otik, where she gets this log and decides it's her baby, and then it comes to life and starts like attacking. It's really weird. Is not anything I expected to be a film. Hmm. And on that weird note, um, would you like to hear about some country wines? I would. <laughs> Excellent. I'm glad you do. <laughs> no. So by country wines, I'm referring to basically any wine that isn't grape wine. So fruit wines, flower wines, root vegetable wines, um, except things like cider and perry, which 
kind of are wines, but historically they're their own thing, so they're not included in country wines. Um, so yeah, they're kind of known, well, known as fruit wines or country wines or hedgerow wines. Um, oh, I like that one, that's evocative. I know, it's a really, it makes you picture like being under a kind of bower of flowers while drinking wine and probably folk dancing, I don't know. Um, <laughs> I'm picturing just venturing into brambles with a, a wicker basket. Yeah, that is kind of what I did last October, and it was a lot of fun. It's is one of my favorite activities. We don't have any good brambles around here. Oh no! Yeah, blackberrying is kind of. I wonder if that's as much of a thing elsewhere in the world. I guess probably, but it's. I like how even if people are not normally that into like you know nature and going out in the wilds and stuff or foraging like blackberrying is kind of the thing that everybody does this whole business is where the premises come to my berry farm and pick some fruit (laughs) true (laughs) so yeah blackberry is probably the most famous fruit to forage but um wine itself i found out goes back to at least 7,000 BC in China, they've found evidence of wine being made. Fruit wines are thought to be older because apparently people discovered the process of wine making before they discovered grapes. The reason grape oh, wine is so popular, sorry? I guess it's probably one of the easiest things to make because you can do it accidentally. Yeah, it's kind of just a like fermented... animals get drunk off. Of fruits. <laughs> yeah, like I think that is basically how it was discovered because it's just fermented plant matter. Basically, anything that you can ferment, you can turn into alcohol. <laughs> and humans discovered that pretty quickly. <laughs> yep. <laughs> In fact, there's isn't there a theory that agriculture partly started because of beer making? Yeah, because we had beer before we had bread. So I think the theory basically goes, we liked beer. We figured, here's how we can make more of it. (laughs) Mmm, solid beer. Um, Yeah, so yeah, we should do an episode on uh, beer or ale. But... um, (laughs) Ancient beer. Yeah, um, but some of the earliest... Um, fruit wines that we know about were made by the ancient Greeks and Romans. They were made with like wild fruits and berries and apples um, because apples were actually apparently introduced to a lot of Europe by the Romans. Um, we should do an episode on apples as well because they're very cool. Apples from like Kazakhstan or something. Yeah, yeah. I watched a documentary about apples that um, apparently there's this forest in Kazakhstan that has loads of wild apple trees that are edible because normally you can't eat wild apples they're too small and sour but these ones there are loads of varieties that are are edible just as they are so apparently they're like the ancestors of most varieties in the world which is crazy um anyway I think I need to go to Kazakhstan yeah I kind of want to (laughs) Um, (laughs) I'll try and, if we I'll get, get enough video. Patreon followers, <laughs> we'll go on a research trip to Kazakhstan. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so the reason grapes got so popular for wine is because grapes have like the perfect kind of balance of sugar to, and like sugar and juiciness and kind of everything that's needed to activate the wild yeasts in the atmosphere. That makes sense. Right. Grapes are pretty amazing. It is pretty amazing. They're like, that, that's why they're kind of the perfect fruit for making wine and why most wine is made with grapes today. Um, other things that you make wine out of other than grapes kind of need a little helping hand in order to get it to ferment so they might need yeast or sugar added 
So when I made my blackberry wine, I added sugar and yeast. I think I added a bit too much sugar <laughs> because the sugars in the fruit or the added sugars are converted to alcohol in the fermentation process. Um, so I think I added a bit too much sugar, which is why my wine is so alcoholic. <laughs> um, but apparently, interestingly, um, modern winemakers often use yeast and sugar anyway because it allows them to control the ABV or the alcohol content of the wine. And that makes that, sense. It's a lot easier to keep within legislation that way. Yeah, definitely that. And apparently wines today are stronger than they used to be by quite a bit. So when there's a lot of discussion of like wine in ancient sources, it's not that everyone was drunk all the time. It's just that wine was less strong. <laughs> Well, I know the ancient Greeks, at least, they often, like the Athenians, rather, should be more specific because it wasn't a country as such, um, used to dilute it. And if you drank your wine straight, you were kind of seen as barbaric. <laughs> oh, man, I'm such a barbarian. <laughs> oh, actually, uh, fun fact. Which country do you think consumes the most wine in the world? Okay. If you're asking me this, that means it's not France, because that's too obvious. One? Yeah, it's not France. Um, oh, is, it, is it us? It's not us, um, surprisingly. I think we probably have more of a taste for beer. Um, although I think the UK does consume a lot of wine. Yeah. It's the Vatican City. Vatican City consumes more I'm wine. Than... This is per head. Yes. <laughs> yeah, ninety bottles per adult per year, apparently. Oh. Consumed in the Vatican City. And most City. of that isn't going to be Jesus blood, is it? That's just going to be regular drinking wine. I mean, I I wouldn't think so. Yeah, I, I, that can't all be like communion wine. Yeah, I don't know. But I said Jesus blood. <laughs> but like. Yeah, it's, uh, apparently there's there's a lot of wine drinking going on in the Vatican. Maybe I should go hang out there. I mean, they need something to do. They're not, <laughs> they're not allowed to do a lot of the fun things. They might as well just drink a lot of wine. Yeah, might, might as well just drink. Um, so, um, yeah, but fruit wines have always been popular because they're quite easy to make yourself. and. In a lot of climates where grapes don't grow that well, um, particularly Northern Europe, it's kind of traditional to make country wines and basically make wine out of whatever you've got because um, it's cheap. You can The fruit is free. You can just go out and get it. Basically, the only thing you need to buy is sugar if you're doing it traditionally. Um, so historically wines and different kinds of wines have been enjoyed by a lot of people most famously probably mead which is honey wine oh yeah i've, I've definitely come across mead uh mead is delicious um it's also great as like a dessert wine or something it's quite sweet but i also <laughs> just drink it um because it's great mulled mead in winter oh my goodness is amazing <laughs> like with as, as has been said previously i don't drink but i am a fan of mulling i've had mulled apple juice yeah that was very yummy so delicious just just mulling things is great um so eleanor of aquitaine apparently enjoyed her pear wine and leonardo da vinci reportedly kept like fig and peach wine on hand in case he got thirsty um there's also a lot of regional kinds of country wines. So, for example, in Japan and Korea and Southeast Asia, plum wine is quite popular because there's a lot of plum trees. Um, in fact, when I was living in Vietnam, we went for the weekend to stay in this bed and breakfast place. And the grandfather of the family who owned it gave us some of his homemade plum wine. 
which was more like brandy actually <laughs> it was <laughs> it was pretty strong um, but yeah good stuff um rice wine obviously in hawaii they have pineapple wine in the philippines apparently they make wine out of mangoes which which sounds delicious. And in Finland, apple wine is quite popular. And apparently in Finland, fruit wine outsells grape wine. So I guess it's still pretty traditionally enjoyed. That's quite cool. So can I ask you a question? Yes. Is there a functional difference between, because you mentioned pear wine, is, a fun, is there a functional difference between that and perry? Or is it just sort of a nomenclature? Yeah, Perry um, is basically pear cider. Um, it's kind of the same thing. Basically, I don't think there really is a difference. I mean, please correct me if I'm wrong. Um, there must be. There must be like a country wine marketing board or something i mean if there's a uk tripe marketing board <laughs> there's probably one for everything <laughs> so like please if anyone's listening and i'm wrong correct me but i believe there is not much difference at all between perry and pear wine it's basically the same thing it's a ferment it's an alcoholic beverage made from fermented pears Sometimes it's sparkling, but you can also get still. So I, yeah, I think Perry and Cider are essentially the same process as winemaking, but with added yeast, I think. Okay, cool. So, yeah, but just historically, because they have been such a big category in themselves. I think they're kind of excluded from the country wines because they have been made industrially. That's fair. I guess, In the same I guess way the Wurzels singing about apple wine wouldn't have, have worked as well. <laughs> yeah, the, the Wurzels are the uh, main producers. <laughs> um, actually, also, apparently, in um, the play and film Arsenic and Old Lace, the which, which oh. yeah which for anyone who hasn't seen it is great it's about two sweet old ladies who murder people because you know oh he's he's just so lonely kicking around in that house by himself it's it's you know yeah, they, we thought we'd do kindness they take in lonely old men and then poison them and bury them in the basement yeah and also there's um, a guy that thinks he's teddy roosevelt oh, i forgot about that <laughs> um yeah, so in Arsenic and Old Lace, the murders, are, the, the poison is elderberry wine that has been poisoned. So I don't know if there's any symbolism there or anything, but it's quite interesting. Um, yeah, so things you can make wine out of, um, as I mentioned, basically any fermentable plant material some of the most popular ones are elderflower wine which elderflower cordial is pretty popular um but elderflower wine is also traditionally like a really really popular country drink um and it does it's it's really nice it's kind of like a dry white wine um that's really good cold on a hot day dandelion wine which is quite bitter but some people really enjoy that taste um apricot cherry blackberry raspberry any kind of soft fruits will make oh, maybe not so much blackberry but like a sweet wine um black currants anything like that and then there are some interesting ones i found um for example oak leaf wine i don't know how that tastes but i'm quite tempted to try it uh, nettle wine and birch wine. So, I I just looked up because I'm sure I was sure that there was something with um, elderberry, and um, yeah. So the genus that elderberry is a part of is called Sambucus, 
Which really? sounds a lot like Sambuca. It's actually the <laughs> etymology of Sambuca. So even though oh. Ambu- Sambuca is normally now like a, a star anise thing, I like that's that's of... what its main flavor is. Um, it actually comes from um, an elderberry liqueur, and it just kind of gradually changed meanings to be this um, star anise thing. Wow, I mean, it's still relevant. Like, I'm glad I know that now. <laughs> um, yeah, so the traditional way to make wine. Um, I'm I'm going to talk a bit about kind of the traditional way to make these country wines and then how you can sort of, how people make it today and what you kind of need in order to get started if anyone's interested in doing it. Um, so I made my first wine last year. Uh, it was a blackberry wine. I've already posted about it on our Twitter, I think. Um, came out quite nice. Um, very kind of dark red, a little bit acidic, but not too much. Um, quite alcoholic. <laughs> uh, but yeah, overall, um, it's definitely wine and it tastes okay. So I'm pretty happy with that. I think next time I'm going to try and adjust the sugar quantity a little bit, see if I can adjust the alcohol content. <laughs> Let me see if I can make it, make it a bit sweeter. But I'm pretty happy with it. Um, So my granny used to make wine and I have a book of hers called Easy Made Wine and Country Drinks by Mrs. Jennery Taylor, (laughs) published in, it's in Roman numerals, so I don't think I'm going to bother trying to work that one out, but I'm pretty sure it is 1960s. You want to type it into the chat and I can tell you what it (laughs) <laughs> okay, hold on. Um, I've had a Roman phase, I can still do numerals. I can edit this bit out, but there's yeah. a lot of numerals. 1957. Oh, okay. Okay. I'm so if you just say 1957, we can edit that. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, so I have this book here that was my grandma's. It's called Easy Made Wine and Country Drinks by Mrs. Jennery Taylor, published in 1957. And it has recipes for a lot of wines, basically made out of pretty much anything. Um, (laughs) It says in the preface, this book is intended for the ordinary housewife or perhaps her husband. Oh, (laughs) men in the kitchen. Yeah, oh, scandalous. Um, and my my granddad did make beer, but also my granddad cooks, which is I feel is unusual for his generation. Possibly, I don't know. I mean, my granddad's embroidered, so I think what we think of as traditional gender roles were not necessarily that traditional back in the day. I don't know. I mean, it depends um, how how unusual our granddads are. True. <laughs> But we have a tablecloth that my granny and granddad made when they were courting, as he put it. Um, and they, they embroidered it together. And he was mad because she made him do all the leaves and she got to do all the flowers, which is adorable. It's amazing. Yeah. <laughs> it's, we still have it. It's one of my favourite items. Um, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read you this recipe for blackcurrant wine from this book. The only ingredients are four pounds of blackcurrants, four pounds of granulated sugar and one gallon of cold water. Strip the blackcurrants from the stalks and wash them carefully so as not to lose too much of the juice. Put them in a large bowl and crush them well using a wooden spoon. Pour on a gallon of cold water and stir thoroughly. Cover the bowl and leave for 10 days, but no longer. Then strain and add the four pounds of granulated sugar. Stir daily for three days, then bottle. It should be ready to drink in six months. So I love how straightforward that is. Yeah. Basically what you do is you put the things in a bowl and you leave them a bit and then you put sugar in and leave it a bit and then bottle them and hope it it turns into wine. (laughs) 
there's there's literally no other instructions so it's pretty much mix these things together leave them and hope they turn into wine which is the the traditional way to make wine is to have a big bowl and I think a lot of houses used to have these like big bowls where you put everything in and put a cloth over the, over the top and leave it leave it to ferment um which yeah, I have one of these big bowls really you've seen my big bowl oh, yeah I have she's but big and I brown think, and her name is Marjorie I think often people would use like a big wooden or stone bowl um sort of for the purpose mm. um but the problem with that is wine fly. So wine fly. Yeah, the wine fly is. Sorry, the start of the sentence cut out. So I just got wine fly and then a pause. Oh, sorry, <laughs> let me do that again. So the problem with that is wine fly, which is a tiny little fly that, for some reason, comes out of nowhere and is just addicted to wine. So if it gets into the wine, it can turn it really sour, basically make it go off because it will get like bacterias in there. So if the wine is like not sealed or part of it's uncovered, then the wine fly can get in. And you don't want that. So normally the way people do it today, um, and if you're interested in making wine, this is probably what you'll need, is you use a large container that can be corked or sealed in some way. So what I use is a demijohn, which is a, a big glass jar, so about a six litre or six gallon glass jar that can be corked at the top. You can also use, it doesn't have to be glass, you can use a big plastic container um if you look up sort of winemaking containers you'll probably find something um and you need a fermentation trap so what that is is a glass or plastic tube which is folded over itself and i'll put a picture of this on the twitter and on the discard and stuff it's folded over itself in kind of like a squiggly line so what that does is it allows the gas from the fermentation to get out of the container while not letting the wine fly in. So I'm the wine... this here you bend. Is how accurate is that? Sorry, I didn't hear the sentence. Um, I'm picturing basically a U bend. Yeah, basically it's that. <laughs> it's a wine U bend. Um, so. Well, when the wine is fermenting, it releases gas and that gas has to get out. Otherwise, your container will probably explode. So the fermentation trap allows the gas to get out, but it doesn't let the wine fly in because you fill it with a bit of water that sits in the bend. And then it's the like gas will fall out of that um, and the, the wine fly can't get in through the water. See, now I'm wondering, like, I'm surprised that I don't know this because toilets used to be one of my special interests. But I'm now wondering whether the U-Bend was inspired by a fermentation trap. Or maybe the other way around. Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> Which came first, the toilet or the wine? I mean, the U-Bend is like a Victorian invention. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I guess. I guess after. Um, so yeah, what you do is you get your fruit or your whatever you're using to make the wine, and then you get normally about the same for fruit wines. Normally about the same weight of granulated sugar. For flower wines and herb wines and things, it can be a bit different. So you probably want to look up and find a recipe for that. Um, and then you pour water on them and you leave them for a few days for the, and sometimes you can mash the fruit as well and leave it for a few days for all the juice to kind of seep out. 
and then you add sugar and you have to leave it for the fermentation process to begin. Um, usually you might add some yeast as well to start the fermentation process. So you can get wine making yeast on the internet. Um, some people Is use cabin tablets. Regular yeast? Like how, how different is wine yeast from regular yeast, like baking yeast? I don't think it's that different, but I think maybe you know, it might be a little more refined or um, I'm actually not sure. But You've got to use the fancy mm. yeast for wine. <laughs> yeah, wine yeast is a, is a thing. Um, and some people use Camden tablets, which are, they basically sterilise the, the water. So there's no bacteria in it. Um, and you will have to make sure all your equipment is sterilized as well. And then you'll need some bottles. So just wine bottles that you've washed out or something is fine. Um, you leave the wine to start fermenting. And after, I think after about a week or so, it starts fermenting. And then you can take out the fruit so you can like strain it or normally what I'll do is put the fruit the mashed fruit in a kind of a muslin bag or something in the first place and just take that out and then you can put it into your container or your demijohn cork it up with the fermentation trap and then you just leave it to do its work and it will it will bubble it's quite exciting it will just bubble away and you know when it's done when it's become wine is when it stops bubbling so the fermentation process is over <laughs> and then you can transfer it to your bottles and just let it age and have wine that's very cool it's very cool um so there's yeah there's a lot of recipes you can use around online or i'm sure there's loads of books um i don't know that much about it <laughs> yet so um but that's the, the basic process that most people use today. And you can use that with pretty much anything. Um, I just want to finish off by <laughs> reading you a recipe from the end of this book. So at the end, there are some cocktail recipes. Wine cocktails? Oh, yes. Wine cocktails. And one of these cocktails... Hold on, let me just find it. Oh, it was actually in the front. I lied. Okay. Never mind. <laughs> <laughs> so I just want to read you a recipe from this book because it has some cocktail recipes in it. And this cocktail is called Guess What? So here's how wait, wait, are you asking me to guess or is it called Guess What? Okay, that's the name of the cocktail. It's called Guess What? <laughs> Amazing. Yeah. Um, these are some excellent cocktails. So you need half a bottle of blackberry wine, half a bottle of rhubarb wine, one wine glass of ginger wine, one glass of port, half a glass of whiskey, mix together and you have the answer. Which I mean, is... Is the whiskey going to do much? I don't know. It's, it's one of the most ridiculous cocktails, although not quite as ridiculous as this one, which is called Lucky Dip. Half a bottle of rhubarb wine, half a bottle of marrow wine, one glass of ginger wine, one glass of whiskey, one glass of rum, a tumbler of carrot wine and a tumbler of ginger beer. Wow. <laughs> that is definitely alcoholic. That, that's intense, though. There's one or two flavours in there, isn't there? Yeah. So that sounds like an interesting time. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, there you go. Um, short history and explanation of country wines. Um, if you feel inspired to give it a go, then definitely would recommend. See how you do. Absolutely. Tweet us at Bread and Thread if you do it. We, we, want, and we, then, want to know. we want pictures we want everything <laughs> tweet us a picture of you half an hour after you've drunk the wine assuming you can still use a camera we need it for research purposes <laughs> <laughs> so if you enjoy this podcast don't forget to subscribe on patreon at patreon.com forward slash bread and thread
Patron rewards include instructional videos, recipes, and access to a Discord server where you can discuss crafts and food. Um, my local order this week, I thought I'd go local to me. Um, so you might have, you might be aware that, you know, in the past, basically any handheld size baked good could be referred to as a cake. Or if you're not from the north, a cake. Um, (laughs) So I just wanted to talk briefly about the amount of things from Lancashire that are still made and still popular that are called cakes that are not cakes by any modern definition. (laughs) Yeah, I guess, like, cake... When I think of cake, I think of a sweet thing. Well, they're they're all sweet in that they've got fruit in them. Okay. Well, apart from one of them, which is also my favourite one, um, which is... um, It's actually a biscuit. It's kind of shortbread adjacent. Uh, It's called a goosner cake. Um, So this one is a biscuit that's traditional to have around Easter which is basically a shortbread with caraway seeds in. Mm. I think I've made them for you before, Hazel. They're I, yeah, I absolutely they're adore them. Well, and I think I enjoyed them. That's an interesting name. Uh, Guzna is a small village nearish to Preston in East Lancashire. I have actually... We, we drove through there once with my... Um, when I was on a holiday with my parents, and we did pick up some goosner cakes. I've been to the source. <laughs> awesome. Okay, what what else is cakes that isn't? Okay, um, so most of these are pastries and are variants of um, sort of the genre of food that is known locally um, as a fly cake or a fly pie. Um, because they can, because they contain currants or raisins. Um, so it's a similar thing to a lot of people, at least a lot of people that I know, um, refer to things like a Garibaldi biscuit as a fly's graveyard because it's got all the little black specks in it. (laughs) So these are all in that kind of vein. Um, the first one I, I want to mention is um, the Chorley cake, which is basically a thin, short crust, um, kind of a flat pie mm. um, with currants inside of it. I would say that sounds good, but I hate currants. <laughs> you probably would not like most of these then. You yeah, might like a Blackburn I mean, cake, which I'll get to. It ruins a lot of traditional UK pastries for me because they all have currants in. So a chocolate cake is normally a couple of inches wide, um, but you also get uh, the sad cake. What? Sorry. The sad cake. <laughs> cake that is sad. Oh, you weren't just giving me a nickname. <laughs> no. Um, that can be up to 12 inches in diameter is basically a giant chorley cake. But why is it sad? Because it's all flat, like what we would think of as a cake. It's all flat and sad. Oh, I never Um, thought I'd feel something for a cake. But what's nice about sad cakes, though, is you get a slice of it. You can have it sweet or savoury. Like, some people have it with butter or jam, but you can also have it with cheese. So kind of like a scone? Um, I mean, I've never heard of having cream on one, but a similar kind of um, okay. flexibility. I hereby name them the Manchester scone. 
I mean, there is already a Manchester tart, which contains custard and cherry jam. Ooh. Which, they taste really good, but cherries make my tongue itch, so I've only had one. Um, so there's also the Eccles cake. Um, I, know, I, I have heard of the Eccles cake. Yeah, I mean, you used to live salford didn't you? So you lived quite near to Eccles, because that's now yeah, part of Salford. Yeah, I did. Um, although Eccles had a tram line, um, Swinton didn't, so yeah. Um, so the main difference between an Eccles cake and a Chorley cake is that an Eccles cake is um, puff pastry. I see. So it's much more crumbly when you eat it, which is why between the two I do prefer an Eccles cake. I think I have had an Eccles cake. Um, I think that there's a lot of regional cakes that are pastry wrapped around sultanas. <laughs> yeah. Um, I know there's a couple from uh, the Midlands and from Oxfordshire as well, but I'm talking about Lancashire. Okay. Um, but Eccles cakes are more firmly sweet because you normally get them with sugar on. Hmm. And don't they normally have the little um, kind of slits in the top? Yeah. Um, but one that you might like is a Blackburn cake. Okay. Which is basically the same like structurally except instead of currants or sultanas it's um apple as the filling Ooh, now that does sound it's like kind of a puff pastry apple pie essentially is a black okay cake. yes yeah i am in favor of these <laughs> um so those are the main ones that i've sort of encountered in my day-to-day life you're making me want to like come up there and eat all of the things now. Well, you can get. I've seen all of these except for the Goosner cake, various places on Berry Market, which is my local market and also the winner of Britain's favourite market, which is understandable because it's great. Uh, Brit- Britain's favourite market. Sorry, it cut out again. Britain's favourite market. Oh, cool. That's a contest. It is. Um, so, yeah, that's... Um, so that's about everything for today's episode. As we said, you can tweet at us at uh, Bread and Thread on Twitter. Or if you want to suggest an episode or just say hi, um, we also have an email address, uh, breadandthreadpodcast at gmail.com. We also have a Patreon account, um, Bread Thread, where you can find instructional videos, recipes, a Discord server, and lots of good stuff. Yeah, we will speak to you next time.